Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We are in the Gospel of Mark. We're beginning a new chapter. We're in chapter 13 with a new subject. We're going to look at verses 1 through 13, which is kind of which is basically the introduction to the chapter. So we read, as he was going out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, behold, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left upon another which will not be torn down. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew were questioning him privately. Tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign when all these things are going to be fulfilled? And Jesus began to say to them, see to it that no one misleads you. Many will come in my name saying, I am he. And will mislead many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be frightened. Those things must take place. But that is not yet the end. For nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will also be famines. These things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. But be on your guard. For they will deliver you to the courts, and you will be flogged in the synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my name's sake, as a testimony to them. The gospel must first be preached to all the nations. When they arrest you and hand you over, do not worry beforehand about what you are are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but it is the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death and father his child, and children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of study in it together. Let's bow together in prayer. Mark 13 is known as the Olivet Discourse because it was a lesson Jesus gave to His disciples while sitting on the Mount of Olives. It is a chapter about the future. People have always wondered about the future. Men in the ancient East studied the stars to learn it. In Greece, they asked for prophecies from oracles. In Rome, soothsayers studied the entrails of dogs. Even today, people read their horoscopes in newspapers every morning to learn what they should or shouldn't do that day. We have analysts called futurists who write books like the 1970 bestseller Future Shock and its sequels. But, as Yogi Berra or Mark Twain or some wag said, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. Actually, it's impossible. No one knows the future but God. He has written it. But His Son made it known to His disciples one afternoon on the Mount of Olives. This is the longest lesson the Lord gave in the Gospel of Mark. That indicates its importance. In fact, knowing the future revealed through Christ and the prophets and the apostles is necessary. Paul makes that very point. He called the return of Christ the blessed hope. John said that everyone who has this hope fixed on Him purifies himself. Christians need to know the future as revealed in the Bible. It is essential for our holiness and life. And this chapter in Mark is vitally important for us. It was given at the end of a long day, which began with Jesus teaching in the temple and ended with Jesus pronouncing doom on the temple. 
That's found in Matthew's account. The nation's leaders had rejected him. After exposing them as hypocrites, he added, or he ended rather, in Matthew 23, by saying, Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. As the disciples followed Jesus out of the temple and down the road through the Kidron Valley, that uh, prophecy of doom must have been on their minds. It was hard for them to imagine. Herod had rebuilt the temple into a majestic structure of colonnaded courts, porches, and buildings. The disciples were especially impressed with its white stones. Josephus described them as being about 25 cubits in length, 8 cubits in height, and 12 cubits in width. They were huge, finely cut snow stones that weighed many tons. The disciples pointed that out to him. Teacher, behold, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. It was a magnificent structure. The temple itself, the, the sanctuary, was made of white marble decorated with gold. When the sun shone on it in the morning, it looked from a distance like a snow-covered mountain. It was an architectural wonder. The rabbi said, He who has not seen the temple in its full construction has never in his life seen a glorious building. And Jesus agreed. They were great buildings. But he said, they were all coming down. Not one stone will be left upon another. Now he said that in A.D. 33. 31 years later, in the year 64, the temple was finally finished. Two years later, in the year 66, the Jews revolted against Rome. And four years later, in A.D. 70, Jerusalem was sacked. The temple was burned and demolished. Only some relics of the outer wall remain today, enough to give some sense of how great the stones were and how magnificent the whole structure had been. But the Lord's prophecy came true. It was even memorialized in a triumphal arch that the emperor Domitian built in Rome to honor his brother Titus, who conquered Jerusalem. It stands today at the Forum across from the Colosseum. And pictured in the stone inside of the ark, you can see Roman soldiers carrying away the menorah, the, 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 the lamp and the treasures of the temple. It's an existing testimony corroborating the accuracy of the Lord's prophecy, which was a stunning declaration that naturally gave the disciples a desire to know more. So when Jesus sat down on the top of the Mount of Olives with a, a wide view of the temple and its buildings before Him, some of them, Peter and James and John and Andrew, asked for more. Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign when all these things are going to be fulfilled? In Matthew's account, they also ask, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? They evidently thought the destruction of the temple was so significant that it would begin a series of events that would bring about the end of the age and the establishment of the kingdom. And they evidently were thinking that this would happen in their lifetime. But as Jesus describes the events that would be a sign of His coming in the kingdom, it's clear that these things would occur over a long period of time, not immediately. He gave some general signs in verses 5 through 13, our passage, which describes the age of the apostles up until the present time. In verses 14 through 23, he describes an intensification of events, the tribulation just before his return. And then in verses 24 through 27, he describes his return. But first he gave a warning. And so much of this is a warning for the church, for his disciples, the apostles, and for us. See to it that no one misleads you. Not everything that seems to be a sign of the end of the world is a sign of that. And not everyone who speaks on these things is trustworthy. 
Most people aren't enamored of fortune tellers and astrologers, but some who are rational about those things might be drawn in by a clever charlatan teaching on the Bible in the future. The apostles wrote about this. They wrote about false prophets in the churches. And the Jews themselves were led astray by false Christs. A hundred years after rejecting the true Messiah, the Jews followed a false one named Bar Kokhba. Rabbi Akiba identified him as the Messiah. He was a brigand, he was a robber, but he was a bit of a, a soldier. And so he saw in this charismatic figure the Messiah and named him Bar Kokhba, which is a title that comes from Numbers chapter 27 and verse 17, Son of the Star. He led a second revolt against the Romans that again ended in slaughter and slavery. They followed a false messiah. One of the strangest characters to come along in Jewish history came along in the 17th century, a man named Shabtai Zvi. Rabbis and Jews all over the Middle East and, and Europe followed him. And it too was a fiasco. The Jews in Germany and across Europe sold their possessions, were standing on the docks of Hamburg when they learned it was all a sham and they devastated their economies. There were numbers of people like this in the history of the church in the Middle Ages and even during the Reformation, false prophets and charismatic figures that attracted large followings. One took over the city of Munster in Germany, a man named John of Leiden. He declared that the city was the New Zion and was crowned king and took multiple wives. And that incident, of course, again ended in slaughter. There are people in modern times who have declared themselves to be the Messiah. The world is full of quacks and impostors who take advantage of the weak and naive to draw them into a web of lies. The Lord warned of this from the very beginning. Many would come. He warned of other things, of wars. He told the disciples not to be frightened by them or rumors of wars. Those things must take place, he says, but that is not yet the end. There have always been wars and disturbances. Don't be frightened by these things and lose hope. That's what he's saying here. And also, don't lose perspective. Don't think that these wars or these events signal the end of days. They don't. Now, people have done that thought that they were living in the worst of times, think, thought that they were living in the very worst generation. I think every generation thinks that. Every Christian says, can it can get any worse than this. And things do get worse. But that's not the end. But some have set dates according to that. They've been so stirred that this must be the end of times because look at the way things are going. I think we must have that sense about us ourselves. Now, there are examples of that all through history. They should be signposts to us. They should be warnings to us. Some famous ones like that of William Miller, a Baptist pastor who, from his studies of the book of Daniel, calculated Jesus would return on March 21st, 1843. His followers numbered in the thousands. He was famous. Some put on white robes and waited on hills. They were disappointed. And th there are more recent examples of that. Back in 2011, you may remember, I came down LBJ Freeway and there was a big billboard advertising the coming of Christ and it was that day that he was coming. So I thought, well, why don't I just turn around, go home? <laughs> They were disappointed too. Then there was uh, the blood moon prophecy. You remember that of a few years ago? I don't know whatever happened with that. These kind of things happen. They come along. And so it goes. People, people are deceivers or they are self-deceived and misinterpret the times in which they're living or they're careless about the Bible and conclude 
that the end is near. The Lord told His disciples not to do that. Don't be taken in by that. Whenever you hear someone giving a date for Christ's return, take my word for this. Whenever you hear a date given or someone suggesting that it's in this general time period, dismiss it. If they give you a date, know this, it's not going to happen on that date. A lot of things are going to happen before Christ returns. And that's what He's telling His disciples. In verse 8, the Lord tells them how widespread and diverse these catastrophes will be, for nation will rise up against nation. Well, right there, that tells you that there's going to be a long period of time that goes on. Nations rising up against nations. That's not going to happen in an instant. Kingdoms against kingdoms. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will also be famines. These things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Now many of the apostles and their contemporaries would live long enough to see some of these things occur in their lives. The the Jews, as I've mentioned, rebelled. They rebelled twice against Rome and the Romans would brutally crush their revolt twice. During the first revolt in Rome, while in the east in Jerusalem and Judea, there's this revolt going, there was a civil war occurring in the capital. In the year 69, there were four emperors. They killed each other off until the fourth, and that was Vespasian, who was the general of the Roman army in Jerusalem, he left the campaign, put his son Titus in charge, he came back to Rome, he put things in order. But there was political turmoil in that time. And there would be natural calamities too. In 79 AD, Mount Vesuvius would erupt and bury the city of Pompeii under ash. Great earthquakes would occur in the years that followed, the centuries that went by, the Lisbon earthquake in 1755 killed 60,000 people. Shook the faith of people all over Europe. In 1906, the great San Francisco earthquake killed 3,000 people. And we're, we're waiting for what people call the big one. But none of this is abnormal. There had been earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, wars among nations long before Jesus sat down on the Mount of Olives. And that is his point. Don't expect the end to come soon. That's what he was telling them. And don't misread the signs of the times. Calamities will continue as they have from the very beginning. We live in a fallen world. And that fall And the sin of that fall has affected everything from the realm of nature to human nature. So Jesus tells them not to draw the wrong conclusion from such events. These things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. King James Version has the beginning of sorrows. Birth pangs or birth pains is more literal. So these events don't mean nothing, all these events signal something. They indicate that the world is not right, that something is wrong with nature. This is not the way things should be. In fact, if you want to know the way things should be, if you want to know what the normal situation is from God's perspective, what it would be had a fall not occurred, then read Isaiah 11 and verse 6. A wolf dwelling with the lamb. Nature is not to be red in tooth and claw. It is that because of the fall, because of sin. It needs correcting. And, and, And all of the things that we see going on, the disturbances, the violence, all of that in nature and in the cosmos for that matter, reminds us of that. It reminds us that things are not the way they're supposed to be. The world is out of joint. And it reminds us that one is coming who will put things right. 
In Romans 8, and verse 22, Paul writes along these same lines. He writes of the creation groaning and suffering birth pains, a reference to natural disasters. I think those on the earth and those in the heavens, for that matter. These things presage the Lord's return. Only Christ, who holds the universe together, can put it right. He does hold it together. That's what Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 17. He holds it all together by the will of His power. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, the author writes that He upholds all things by the word of His power. And what that literally means is He holds up the ages. Actually, He is carrying the ages along by the will of His power. That means time is His creation. He is burying every event along. Christ is directing all of that to a particular end and goal of history. And He will put it right, and that goal will be reached. So wars and calamities of all kinds mean something. They remind us of how fallen the world is and indicate the Lord will come just as Birth pangs indicate that a child is on the way. But we must not allow ourselves to be misled by these things into thinking that a calamity in our time is unique and interpreted as signaling that the end is upon us. That's the temptation I think every generation faces. After all, sometimes mothers go into false labor I can remember my wife and I rushing to the hospital more than once only to be sent home. It was a false alarm. Well, we eventually had our first child, and Christ will come. That's our hope. But these things are just the beginning, Jesus said. So we're not to let ourselves be deceived. In verses 9 through 13, the Lord describes the birth pains or sorrows as they will affect the church directly. He says in verse 9 that there will be persecution. But be on your but be on your guard, for they will deliver you to the courts, and you will be flogged in the synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them. And that would begin soon after for the apostles and the early church. And the Lord states it is typical of this age in which we live. Because, because the world hates Him, it will hate us who are identified with Him. That's what He teaches in John chapter 15 and verse 18. Don't be surprised if the world hates you, it hates me. That should be expected. The end of the world... Is, is not, may be upon us, we don't know. But the end would not come before Christ had gone through, uh, before the church rather had gone through trials and persecution for the sake of Christ. Now that is this present age. That's what we're living in. What the church has been living in from the day of Pentecost to the present. It is an age of hostility. So, It will be an age of testing, and it is. But we're not to be fearful or pessimistic because it will also be an age of opportunity for the gospel. In fact, all the opposition that is mounted against the church and is directed against the gospel will be frustrated. The Lord's purpose will succeed. The opposition may be great, the opposition may may be strong, but the gospel will be preached successfully. In fact, the Lord says in verse 10 that the end will come, will rather will not come until the gospel goes throughout the whole world. It must first be preached to all the nations. That is not a condition placed upon the church to the effect that The rapture cannot take place until the whole world hears the gospel. So we better get out and preaching it if we want to bring Christ back. 
This is about the second coming in the Lord's teaching here in Mark 13, Matthew 24. And it means that the worldwide evangelism that he speaks of will occur. In other words, the gospel will prevail in spite of opposition. And then the Lord will return. So it's a statement of assurance or a statement of reassurance. God's mission for the church, the Great Commission of Matthew 28, verse 20, will be fulfilled. It is God's will. Nothing can frustrate His plan. But it's also a reminder for us of God's will for the church. Each generation is to be carrying the gospel into the world. We are to be a mission-minded people. And there will be success in the preaching of the gospel as well as opposition. Still, we will be opposed and the opposition will be strong. The Lord comes back to that in verses 11 through 13. He wanted them to be prepared. It doesn't sugarcoat things. He gives the truth as it is. And he, he did that so that they would be forewarned and they would not be expecting something wonderful to be coming when something difficult, in fact, does come. But again, he encouraged them in verse 11 by telling them that when they were arrested and put on trial, they were not to worry about that, not to worry because they what they would need to say at that time because they would be given what was needed at that time. It would be supernatural. It is not you who speak, Jesus said, but the Holy Spirit. Now this is the kind of, of assurance the Lord gives in other places uh, when He gave the Great Commission. At the end of uh, Matthew 28, the end of the Gospel of Matthew, he told them, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He is sending us out on his mission with his message, and he will not leave us on our own or not leave us to our own devices to fend for ourselves. Through the Holy Spirit, he will give us the right response. I say this frequently, and I think it's worth saying repeatedly. The Christian life is not a natural life. We have lives that are distinctly different from that of the men and women of the world. The Christian life is a supernatural life. Every believer in Jesus Christ, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, has been sealed with the Holy Spirit. He dwells within every believer. He empowers us. And He's speaking of that here. Don't be worried when you're brought into these difficult situations. He's with us. And He'll give us the things that we need to say at the right time. Now, th this has nothing to do with preparing sermons or lessons. It has nothing to do with, with uh, not needing to study and prepare because we certainly need to do that. In uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, and verse 15, Peter instructed all of us, every Christian, young and old, male and female, whoever you are, always be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that's in you. Are you ready to make a defense? Can you defend the gospel? Can you explain the gospel? Well, that takes some study, and that takes a lot of study. It really takes a lifetime of study to be able to accurately and present well the, the Word of God. Well, this statement that our Lord is making here has to do with persecution. It has to do with a particular situation. And the replies that Christians may suddenly have to, to make unexpectedly. See, we can't always prepare a formal, formal speech or or a proper answer when the occasion comes. Sometimes it comes uh, as a surprise to us when we're not expecting it. What we can do to prepare for that is in times of peace, such as we are living in now, is fill our minds with the Scriptures. Fill our minds with the doctrines of the Word of God, with the knowledge and experience of God. 
apply ourselves to the Word of God and knowing it. And then when such occasions occur that are unexpected, we will be ready. And the Holy Spirit will use us greatly. He did Peter when he and John were arraigned before the Sanhedrin for preaching the gospel in the temple. Luke wrote about this in the book of Acts. And Peter, he says, was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he gave that august court, the Sanhedrin, the gospel clearly and boldly. Now he had been a coward weeks before and denied Jesus three times. But here he stood strong. He stood before the authorities, the Jewish authorities and powers of that day. And he told the court, they crucified Christ. And there was no other name under heaven that had been given among men by which we must be saved. He's the Savior. And he tells them that very directly. And they were impressed. The judges were amazed at the confidence of Peter and John. That was the Holy Spirit. That's the supernatural work that goes in the life of every believer. A little later, in Acts chapter 6, Luke wrote that a great many of the priests were coming, were becoming obedient to the faith. That's an amazing statement. A great many priests. Was that due to the bold speech of Peter and John there before the priests in the Sanhedrin? Well, Luke doesn't say, but perhaps. Paul was in similar situations when he was in prison in Caesarea. The governor, the first governor, was Felix, Roman governor, and Paul spoke to him. And he gave him the gospel, spoke to him about the judgment to come. And Luke writes, Felix trembled. He stood before the Roman governor Festus and the Jewish king Agrippa with his consort Bernice. And there was Paul in this amazing assembly of dignitaries and soldiers and all kinds of, uh, of, of powerful people. And Paul comes out there in chains and defends the gospel, gives an impassioned presentation of the faith before those people. That's the work of the Spirit of God. These men, the apostles, knew the Word of God, but the Spirit of God called it up and directed them and empowered them. That's the assurance that Christ was giving His disciples here in these moments of difficulty when they were brought into the court or they were brought into the synagogue and they were put on trial. The Spirit of God would be with them. They would never walk alone is what He's saying. And it is what explains the great witness that men and women have had down through history in some of the most challenging and frightening experiences, facing fire and sword. Jesus didn't minimize the danger and sorrow, sorrow that, that, that would threaten them and threaten the church. People's love would grow cold. He speaks of that at the end times. Matthew speaks of that in his discussion on this in Matthew 24 and verse 12. They would betray their closest associates, closest relatives. That's what he says here. Brother will betray brother to death and father his child. And children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. What a terrible scenario that is. It sounds a lot like something out of Orwell's 1984. But this is the world. This is the present world, not some futuristic fiction. And it has been the world since Adam left the garden. The first crime was fratricide. Cain rose up and killed Abel, his, his, his own brother. And so it has gone over the ages. Families and friends divided over the gospel. Cain hated Abel because he hated grace. And men will hate us for that very reason. It's what Paul called the offense of the cross in Galatians 5.11. It produces hostility. The worst hostility. Brother against brother. Parent against child. You remember in John chapter 9 when Jesus healed the blind man. 
His own parents would not defend him against the Jewish authorities. They abandoned him, abandoned their own son because they were afraid that they would be expelled from the synagogue. That's the nature of things for the saints in this world. And the Lord wanted his disciples to know that, to be forewarned. Before a person builds, he said, he must count the cost. That's only wise. And that's especially true of the Lord's disciples. We need to count the cost because there is one for those who follow Christ. You will be hated by all because of my name, he said. It's the offense of the cross. There is encouragement, however, because he then says, but the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. And all of God's elect will endure to the end. Not in our strength, but in His. That's the promise of Scripture. No one will snatch you out of my hand, the Lord said in John chapter 10, verse 28. Philippians 1, 6. He who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. It is that supernatural work of the Lord through the Holy Spirit who seals the heart of every believer that enables us to stand firm in the faith. He is the one who creates faith within us continually, gives us strength, gives us the ability to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. He's the one that produces the fruit in us. We must be obedient, and the child of God will be obedient and will persevere, but ultimately it's because of the Lord God who's at work in us, and He will not fail to do that, and He will not let us go. We will persevere to the end. So the Lord's message is, don't be naive and don't be fearful about the future. God has a plan. It is perfect and unfolding just as He has told us it would. And we are safe in His sovereign control. Someday it will end. Someday we will come to the end of the age and it will be victorious. We don't know when. We're living in what the Lord called the beginning of birth pangs. But they've gone on now for 2,000 years. That's a long beginning. And the world is smaller today and more dangerous today than it ever has been before. We are, we're, we're certainly closer to the end now than we've ever been. The prophetic clock is ticking down. So maybe we can describe our situation the way Winston Churchill described England's after some victorious, some victories early in the Second World War. He gave a speech that was cautiously optimistic. He said, this is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end, but is perhaps the end of the beginning. Well, maybe that's true for us as well. After 2,000 years of birth pains, maybe we are at the end of the beginning. Certainly something we're to hope for. We have a real hope of the Lord's return and we're to be looking for it. And we know it's closer now than it's ever been. The end of history, we know, will come in God's time according to His plan. But there is another end that should concern each of us and I think concern us even more, and that is our own end. We each will have one. We know that. It too is God's plan. He has numbered the hairs of our head and He has numbered the days of our life. Every one of our days has been numbered. Are you ready for that? There's only one way to prepare, and that is to believe in Jesus Christ as Savior. He died for sinners. He died in their place. He bore the punishment due to do their sins so that all who believe in Him would be saved. If you've not believed, trust in Christ. He receives all who do and rest confidently in Him. And remember, through this 
present age, through the trials of this life, you will never walk alone. He's with you. Well, I mean, that, may that be an encouragement for us to live positive, active Christian lives in His service. Let's end with hymn number seven in the Songs of Praise book, the white book, Be Thou My Vision, and then remain standing for the benediction. Hymn number seven. Father, there are glorious things to see in this world, and people have had many wonderful visions of them, but there's no greater vision given to anyone than the vision you've given to your people of your Son. We thank you that you've given us eyes to see, and ears to hear. May we follow you well, and may we honor your Son. May we live the gospel and speak the gospel in this age in which we live. We thank you for him and for his death for us. It's in his name we pray. Amen.